Hello and welcome to today's mind map. We're going to be going over A Guide to the Good Life by William B. Irvine. It's the ancient art of Stoic joy. Now, if you've ever wanted to learn about Stoicism, or maybe you've heard some great quotes from a few of the Stoic philosophers, or you wanted to learn just more about Stoicism, this book is going to be the perfect place to start. We're going to be going over quite a lot of the teachings from some of the great Stoic philosophers of old, but we're really going to be going into it in a way that is going to be applicable for your modern life. With that out of the way, let's get into the introduction. First, we're going to talk about William Irvine. He's a professor of philosophy at Wright State University. He's also the author of On Desire, Why We Want What We Want. And I just checked his website. He has a new book coming out September 2019 called The Stoic Challenge. I'm looking forward to that one. That's a very interesting topic and I think it's probably similar to The Daily Stoic, if you've read that book before. That's a great book to kind of follow along with. Every day you get a new teaching from one of the Stoic philosophers. But I recommend you pick up this book, and I recommend you pick up maybe William's next book when he comes out with a Stoic challenge. With that, let's get into the introduction to the actual book, A Guide to the Good Life. The first quote that I pulled from the book to kind of give us a general overview is that this book is written for those seeking a philosophy of life. In the pages that follow, I focus my attention on a philosophy that I have found useful and that I suspect many readers will also find useful. He continues on to say, it is the philosophy of the ancient Stoics. The Stoic philosophy of life may be old, but it merits the attention of any modern individual who wishes to have a life that is both meaningful and fulfilling, who wishes, that is, to have a good life. I wrote this book with the following question in mind. If the ancient Stoics had taken it upon themselves to write a guidebook for the 21st century individuals, a book that would tell us how to have a good life, what might that book have looked like? The pages that follow are my answer to this question. What a great question to ask when you're going over any philosophy, really, right? He's a professor of philosophy, so obviously he's dove deeply into quite a few different philosophies, and that's a great question to start out with. So let's talk about Stoicism a little bit here. Stoicism was originally founded by Zeno. The primary Stoic philosophers, the ones at least that are in this book, are Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and Epictetus. And this book is going to explore all of Stoic philosophy and attempt to give us a guide to how these Stoic philosophers of old would have encouraged us to live our lives today. And I think that's a great way to get started with Stoic philosophy. There's definitely many more nuances than just that, but this is a very interesting philosophy and especially how it applies to today's modern life. The book's filled with great wisdom and a lot of actionable advice. That's one thing about Stoic philosophy that you'll really, really notice is that it's so actionable. They give you things to do, and I love that part of it because I think a lot of philosophy can end up being fairly esoteric and in the mind. And Stoic philosophy really is grounded in action, and that's why I really, really enjoy some of the teachings from these Stoic philosophers. Stoic philosophy can help you in your business, in your mental and spiritual practices, and really in so many different ways in your life. I recommend that you pick up the book for a more in-depth look. Obviously, I only have so much time with you today. I appreciate your time, but this book will go into much more depth if you're looking to learn a little bit more about the Stoic philosophy. So first we're going to talk about the first quote here that I pulled out that I think was important is life is a medium. So according to Epictetus, the primary concern of philosophy should be the art of living, just as wood is the medium or of the carpenter and bronze is the medium of the sculptor. Your life is the medium on which you practice the art of living. And this is exactly what I was talking about, right? The very first quote that I pulled out of the book just shows you how grounded in reality this Stoic philosophy tends to be. He says, all of these different philosophies that we're going to be teaching you throughout this mind map and in this book and all of the things that those ancient philosophers really taught us is really just so that you can sculpt yourself, sculpt your life and really use your life as that medium in which to practice this art of living, which is essentially the art of living your life. So Stoicism, again, Stoicism, a very practical philosophy, and that's why I love it so much. 
Some, if not most of the philosophies and spiritual practices live in the realm of the mind, right? So many different philosophical practices are just happening up in the mind and so many philosophers are all kind of stuck up in the mind. Of course, it can be useful at times and definitely can be learned from for sure. But really what the Stoics are giving us is just a guidebook that we should be able to use in the real world. Practicing and learning Stoicism will lead to real changes in your life, right? For example, you can measure this. Are you happier because of some of the Stoic practices that you've adopted? Are you living a life more full of love and accomplishment? These are ways to measure your progress as far as it goes with adopting new philosophies and learning and improving upon yourself. So practice. Your life is the medium on which you practice the art of living. I think the word practice is so important here. It's not as if we learn to and adopt some of these stoic philosophies, these kind of golden nuggets that I'm going to give you coming up here, we will ever reach a quote unquote end, right? We're never going to actually reach a point where we have reached the height of enlightenment or the height of stoicism. And I think a lot of philosophies kind of give you that impression that you're going to get to a point where you are going to be at the absolute end of any philosophy. And Stoicism really says, hey, no, this is not the truth. What we're really going to be trying to do is just use these philosophies and use these practices and these meditations that we're going to talk about in order to make your life measurably better, right? We're, so in order to do that, we're going to have to commit to a life of practicing some of these teachings that we're going to learn here into our everyday lives. And the first teaching that we're going to go really into, this is kind of life as a medium. This is going to basically just be kind of our modus operandi here. We're going to say, okay, there's a lot of teachings here. There's a lot of practices that I'm going to show you in this mind map. We want to use these as an actual practice. We want to actually use these in our lives. And the first kind of point that we're going to learn from here is virtue. So virtue for the Stoics, a person's virtue does not de depend on, for example, her sexual history. Instead, it depends on her excellence as a human being on how well she performs the function for which humans were designed. And this is very interesting because a lot of philosophies and religions and etc. are going to place your virtue on a scale based on how well you follow their rules. That's very interesting, right? We'll continue on with this quote and then I'll get a little bit into more of what I think virtue is. In the same way that a virtuous or excellent hammer is one that performs well the function for what it was designed, namely to drive nails. A virtuous individual is one who performs well the function for which humans were designed. To be virtuous, then, is to live as we were designed to live. It is to live, as Zeno put it, in accordance with nature. The Stoics would add that if we do this, we will have a good life. So instead of living in accordance to the rules of different philosophies and the rules of different religions or even the rules that we put on ourselves, the more we can live in accordance with our true nature that's going to lead us more towards the good life which is essentially what all of these stoic philosophies are trying to get us to move towards so what is virtue it's kind of my thoughts here often we think of virtuous people of having specific characteristics these characteristics often have to do with the belief system that we were programmed with since birth and you can see the difference here because some people might think a certain person is virtuous if they make a lot of money um, that would be one example of a belief system. People who have a lot of money are virtuous. Another example of a belief system would be people who have a lot of money probably stole it and therefore are not virtuous. You can see how we're programmed with those belief systems since birth. See here, uh, he says nothing to do with sexual history and the, it is one of the potential benefits, belief systems, sorry. The sexual history is one potential, similar to money, is one potential belief system that people might be programmed with. If, for example, someone is sexually experienced, to put it nicely, they are virtuous. That might be one belief system that people might have, and it correlates a lot with several different religions, of course. But a really interesting insight here is that it really has nothing to do with the rules or beliefs. It's about living true to the nature of their being. A virtuous person is someone who develops themselves fully, not in accordance to any rules. So you could think of what are your strengths or what are that person's strengths? If they're striving to become stronger in those areas, then they're living a virtuous life. And what are their weaknesses? If you're striving to bring them up, 
then you are living a virtuous life. So in the end, it's about self-actualization and not about living based on some rules or belief systems that were installed within you, whether it's from birth or even that you've installed in yourself in adulthood. This is an extremely freeing philosophy. You got to think about your life. Where are you measuring your worth based on the rules of these belief systems that might not even be yours? And they might actually be going against your true nature. And where are you measuring the worth of others based on your belief systems that they, again, may or may not share and may or may not be part of their nature? Are they striving to become stronger in the areas that they are naturally strong? And are they tr striving to become stronger in areas that they are naturally weaker in? It's very interesting. And anyone that's striving for self-actualization or personal growth is generally a virtuous person in the books of the Stoic philosopher. Now, the next point that we're going to talk about here is hedonic adaptation. This is probably the one thing that I would say, you know what, if you're going to take this away, other than life is a medium, hedonic adaptation is a great point to take away in your life. See, we humans are unhappy in large part because we are insatiable. After working hard to get what we want, we routinely lose interest in the object of our desire. See, rather than feeling satisfied, we feel a bit bored, and in response to this boredom, we go on to form new and even grander desires. How many of us have been through this before? Where we set a goal, we achieve the goal, we get bored, and then we have to set either something grander or everything just ends up falling apart. The psychologists, Shane Frederick and George Lowenstein have studied this phenomenon and given it a name. It's hedonic adaptation, right? This process of adapting to our current environment and it adapting, uh, adapting to the things that are actually positive, the things that we've actually went out and achieved, we end up adapting to them. So to illustrate the adaptation product process, they point to studies of lottery winners, right? Winning a lottery typically allows someone to live the life of his dreams. It turns out, though, that after an initial period of exhilaration, lottery winners end up having, being about as happy as they were previously. They start taking their new Ferrari and mansion for granted. The way they previously took their rusted out pickup and cramped apartment for granted. And I think we can all kind of sympathize, even if we haven't won the lottery, we've all accomplished some great things in our lives, or I hope we've all accomplished some great things in our lives, and we end up taking them for granted. I know, for example, for me, I set out a goal to get my online marketing company to $10,000 a month while only working 20 hours a week. And after I accomplished that, I had really one of two potential ways that I could go about things. Either I could set a higher goal, or what I could do is let everything fall apart. And that's ended up what happened. And I'm happy because it led me here. But it's very interesting because really what you should be doing is just kind of being aware of this hedonic ad adaptation. Any goal that you set, any goal that you achieve, you are eventually going to become the same level of happiness as you were before. So really the idea is not to set goals in order to be happy, but in, it's to be happy. Focus on trying to live a good life. And the Stoic Art of Joy is a great place to start. But it's about becoming joyful in your life. And then setting goals is just a part of life. It's not necessarily the end goal or it's not the the end of the life right so the next thing human beings are always looking forward after that little thing you see i i was looking forward and then when i wasn't looking forward anymore it became kind of a trap and it became uh quite difficult to go on either either to continue to grow the business or to kind of let it go and, and just kind of uh start something new we may be the only animal that has actually has the ability to look forward this is surely a blessing because, of course, if I didn't say I look forward to a time in my life where I have $10,000 a month coming in and I only work 20 hours a week, if I couldn't do that, then, of course, I would just be in the place where I started or based on my environment, right? So it's a, it's a good thing in that way that I can look forward. But it also can be a curse because we can easily fall into the trap of not being happy in the now and not focusing on the now. We can put our forward-looking ability on things that we want, right? And we think that, okay, the things that we want, once I have them, then I will be enough and then I will be happy. And that obviously is just not the truth. We need to focus on being happy and joyful in the now 
and use our amazing ability to look forward in order to accomplish some great things and you know provide some great value to the world but not use it as a way to motivate ourselves if that makes sense so think about all the things that you have probably accomplished in your life I gave you my example of my marketing company but maybe you've got a new job or you started a business it's awesome you did a great job accomplishing that thing how do you feel about it now maybe it's two months maybe it's two years maybe it's 20 years after you've actually done the thing that you set it to accomplish check yourself are you adapting towards not feeling like it's enough and what I would say here is that hedonic adaptation will always happen and really for me it's been a process of bringing up my baseline level of happiness rather than bringing up my uh, grandiose sense of setting goals I think that's a really really great way to go about it but what we're gonna do here is another way to deal with hedonic adaptation which is visualization we got a couple different types of visualization here coming from the book so the book says the Stoics thought they had an answer to this question this hedonic adaptation question they recommended that we spend the time imagining that we have lost the things that we value that our wife has left us our car was stolen or we lost our job and you'll notice about stoic meditations is they quite often take the opposite path to what normal meditation would be right a lot of the talk about gratitude meditations and a lot of talk about freeing meditations and and those sorts of things and I really think that those are useful but this is kind of the opposite side of the coin you know if one thing is true there's probably also the other side is true in some aspects as well and this is really what we're going to be going through here and really this is going to be a guidebook the different techniques that you can use in order to visualize and get yourself to be away from this hedonic adaptation and be in a more joyful state on a day-to-day -day basis so he said doing this the Stoics thought will make us value our wife our car our job more than we otherwise would this technique let us refer to it as negative visualization was employed by the Stoics at least as far back as Sisyphus it is I think the single most valuable technique in the Stoic philosophy's toolkit so this is one way right the negative visualization technique by the way can be used in the reverse besides imagining that bad things that happen to us happen to others we can imagine that the bad things that happened to us happened instead to others right because uh, yeah very you understand in his handbook Epictetus advocates this sort of projective visualization suppose he says that our servant breaks a cup we are likely to get angry and have our tranquility disturbed by the incidents interesting story because this obviously probably wouldn't happen to most of us but we could maybe use it as a metaphor one way to avert this anger is to think about how we would feel if the incident had happened to someone else instead if we were at someone else's house and his servant broke a cup we would be unlikely to get angry and indeed we might try to calm our host by saying it's just a cup and these things happen engaging in projective visualization so essentially what you're doing is you're projecting yourself into someone else's um, reality Epictetus believes will make us appreciate the relative insignificance of the bad things that happen to us and will therefore prevent them from disrupting our tranquility so that's kind of the opposite side of this negative um, visualization negative visualization can allow us to be more in touch with how great the things that we actually have are and this kind of projective visualization can help us realize how the bad things that might be happening to us or might have happened to us or even in the moment might be happening to us can be kind of turned down the volume can be turned down on those things a little bit by but just projecting ourselves into someone else's reality and alternatively we can do some historical research to see how our ancestors lived we will quickly discover that we are living this is kind of a third different technique that you can use for visualization so we can do some historical research to see how our ancestors lived we will quickly discover that we are living in what to them would have been a dream world that we tend to take for granted things that our ancestors had to live without right including antibiotics air conditioning toilet paper cell phones television windows eyeglasses and fresh fruit in January so many different things so many different things that we have now that they would have absolutely dreamed about back in the day upon coming to this realization we can breathe a sigh of relief that we aren't our ancestors that we are that's that the way our descendants will presumably 
someday breathe a sigh of relief that they aren't us. So those are really three different techniques of visualization to try and deal with this concept of hedonic adaptation. Let's talk about the negative visualization first. So do you want to overcome hedonic adaptation and not take things for your life in granted? Try this. Imagine all the most prized things that you have in your life, right? Maybe your house, your car, all the things that you really like, your loved one, etc. Now imagine losing them all and seriously dive into this. Imagine it with as much vivid imagination as you possibly can. And then after you've done that and you felt the pain of losing all those things, you can finally come back to reality and feel appreciation for actually having those things. Now the second technique is again that projective visualization. Now maybe you're blowing the bad things in your life out of proportion. You can simply try this. When something bad happens to you, put yourself in another person's shoes. How would you want yourself to react if you were that other person? Try to act that way instead of blowing that bad thing out of proportion. But just simply the act of projecting yourself into that other person's reality will allow you to kind of calm everything down. You won't necessarily have to try to act that way. Now, ancestor visualization is a third technique. If you're having trouble seeing just how great your life really is, maybe a lot of bad things are happening all at once and they're feeling like they're piling up, you can simply try this. Think about your ancestors and how hard they had it. You know, a lot of them were living in huts. A lot of them were, um, you know, living in poverty and etc. Would you rather be a person in your position now or someone in the Roman Empire or one of the other places maybe that your ancestors have come from? Of course, we have a lot of modern day amenities. Even the worst of us have a lot of modern day amenities that even the kings and uh, rulers of the olden days wouldn't have had. So we really have it quite good. Now, another technique I would say, right, to kind of deal with how we're not feeling this joy in our lives, we're feeling this hedonic adaptation continually kind of coming in, is this technique of using impermanence to help us really enjoy our lives, right? So he says, like Buddhists, Stoics advise us to contemplate the world's impermanence. All things human, Seneca reminds us, are short-lived and perishable. Says Marcus likewise reminds us that things we treasure are like the leaves on a tree, ready to drop when a breeze blows. He also argues that the flux and change of the world around us are not an accident, but an essential part of our universe. So by cultivate, cultivating the or contemplate, contemplating, sorry, the impermanence of everything in the world, we are forced to recognize that every time we do something could be the last time that we do it. And this recognition can invest the things we do with a significant and a significance and intensity that would otherwise be absent. We will no longer sleepwalk through our lives. And how many of us have probably felt like that before? I know I definitely have. Some people, I realize, will find it depressing or even morbid to contemplate impermanence. I am, nevertheless, convinced that the only way that we can be truly alive is if we make it our business periodically to entertain such thoughts. This is actually a big movement inside of the Stoic philosophy is kind of this idea of memento mori, like we could die at any moment, I believe is what it actually means. And so many people are using this as a way to actually get joy in their lives and really, um, really kind of feel alive. I would say that's probably the best way to talk about it. You can't feel alive unless you feel like or you entertain the thought of your death. So, what I invite you to do here is to meditate on the beauty of impermanence. The Stoics are full of amazing meditations, right? Some of those different visualizations that we just talked about. Instead of seeing everything as blissful and amazing, like a lot of different techniques might get you to do, we actually look for the opposite. We actually do things that might make us uncomfortable. So, for example, think about how everything you're doing could easily, easily be the last thing that you'll ever do. You know, there's kind of that idea that if you you walk in the door, you could be hit by a bus at any moment, right? We don't actually take that into account. The people you talk to and love will quite quickly become old and die and use that simple thought to cherish every moment with them. For me, this seems to be helpful in two different ways. And this isn't in the book, but this is the way that I see it. First is that you can start to appreciate the things in your life for how truly special and meaningful they really are. So that's in and of itself is a great thing. 
Second is that you can say, given my limited time here, is this really something I want to be doing? Right? I only have a limited amount of time on this earth. Is this worth the time? Is this worth the currency that I have to give up in order to live my life? Right? Give this meditation a try and see if it helps you, hopefully in those ways. And I'd love to hear from some of you if you give this meditation a try, some of the realizations that you've had. The final point that we're going to go over here is choice. The quote goes like this. Our most important choice in life, according to Epictetus, is whether to concern ourselves with things external to us or things internal. Most people choose the former, which is the external. They think <clears throat> because they think harms and benefits come from outside themselves, right? They're concerning these uh, they're concerned with the external things, right? So, for example, nowadays people might be watching the news because they might be afraid something bad might happen, right? Or, for example, you might be thinking um, of all the things that you lack or the fear of not having enough money, the fear of not having food, and etc. Because you think that that harm is coming from outside themselves. But according to Epictetus, though, a philosopher, by which he means someone who has an understanding of the Stoic philosophy, will do just the opposite. He will look for all the benefit and harm to come from himself. In particular, he will give up the rewards the external world has to offer in order to gain tranquility, freedom, and calm. And that really is kind of the idea, right? So many of us are focused on making more money and you know having nicer things and etc. And so few of us in today's day and age are focused on inner tranquility, freedom, and calm. Which, really, if you have these things, tranquility, freedom, and calm, whatever happens to you in the external world has much less importance than these three things. And I think that's kind of the idea of most different types of meditation, and Stoic philosophy is definitely a big part of that. Right? So we can think about internal versus external work. Which one of these is truly more important to you? So internal work is developing mastery of your own thoughts, beliefs, and creating a meaningful life for yourself. Developing this feeling of tranquility, freedom, and calm. And external work is focused on the rewards you get, like money, cars, or influence. This single choice is going to be the most important choice that you make in your life. Right? You're either choosing self-mastery or material mastery. Those are two choices that you really have. Likely, if you're here at the end of this mind map, you're on the path that the Stoics would have wanted for us. The path to internal mastery. I want to thank you for being with me here today at the end of this mind map. I will hopefully see you in the next one. And I really appreciate all of you guys watching these videos. If you have any books that you would recommend me doing a mind map on, please leave them down below. Thanks so much, and we'll see you in the next video.